ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim ma taraf fi khalqir rahman min tafawut farj il basara hal tara min futur Summarja il basara karra tene Yan kalib ilai kal basaro khasyan Vahova haseer No incongruity canst thou see in the creation of the gracious God. Then look again, seest thou any flaw? I look again, and yet again. Thy sight will only return unto thee, dazzled and fatigued. These verses from chapter 67 of the Holy Quran were recited at the beginning of a speech. That speech was given 37 years ago. The occasion was the Nobel Prize banquet, 1979, in Stockholm, Sweden. And the speaker, of course, was Professor Dr. Abdus Salam, who had just been honored with the Nobel Prize in physics. And after reciting these verses, Professor Salam said, and I quote, this in effect is the faith of all physicists. The deeper we seek, the more is our wonder excited, and the more is the dazzlement for our gaze, unquote. Dazzlement for our gaze. A beautiful description in Surah Mulk, captured by the first Nobel Prize winner on the grandest stage of science to describe his moment of discovery was and still is today a powerful, powerful reminder of the majesty of the perfect miracle we know as the Holy Quran. Respected chairman and my dear and distinguished guest of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam, today I will present modern discoveries in light of the Holy Quran, discoveries which have dazzled truth seekers over the ages, which have convinced skeptics and as I hope to convince you today, have taken some on a remarkable journey towards Islam. And allow me to begin with the story of one such journey. The journey begins in 1852. A boy is born in the village of Worcestershire, England, and his name is Clement. At the age of five, both of Clement's parents pass away, and he is raised by his grandmother. And at a very young age, Clement developed a fascination for the sciences, for astronomy in particular. And this passion would continue into his adulthood, and it would take him on a journey, a journey around the world to seek the truth. So remember the name, Clement, as I will be returning to his story in a moment. So the Holy Quran, we believe, is a perfect book. In his Allah Oham, Hazrat Akhtas Masih Ma'ud alayhi salatu wasalam, described the Qur'an as an unlimited treasury of insights, verities, and wisdoms, which are expounded in every age. But before I get into some of the examples of this wisdom, we should ask ourselves a general question about persuasion and prediction. How can a skeptic be convinced that a discovery made, or discovery is a fulfillment of a prediction made long ago? It is not surprising that atheists have presented criteria to check the genuineness of a prophecy. For example, Doug Kruger in his book, What is Atheism? Atheism lists some of these criteria. For example, he says the prophecy must be clear and unique. The prophecy must be of an unlikely event. It must not be the result of an educated guess. And the event which fulfills the prophecy mustn't be staged or manipulated. So let us apply these criteria and let us apply it to a simple example from the Holy Quran. Allah Ta'ala says in chapter 15, verse 10, Inna nahnu nazal nazikra wa inna lahu la hafizun. Verily, we ourselves have sent down this exhortation and most surely we will be its guardian. So based on this verse, as we all know, Muslims believe the Quran is unchanged from its original revelation 14 centuries ago. But skeptics for years have questioned this claim. But a discovery made only last year has proven this prophecy to be true. Carbon dating technology at Oxford University has shown that fragments of the Holy Quran found at the University of Birmingham in England in 2015 are dated from the time of the Holy Prophet 
proving that the contents of the Quranic text have indeed been preserved. So by this example, we have a prophecy that is clear, unique, made well before its fulfillment, not based on an educated guess, and unstaged, fitting all of those criteria. So this demonstrates that even by the yardstick of one who denies the very existence of God, divine miracles in the form of fulfilled predictions exist throughout the Holy Quran as a sign of its truth. So allow me to get into a few examples. And for the first example, I take you to deep space. Allah Ta'ala says, وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَانَاهَا بِأَدِمْ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِئُونَ And the heaven we built with our own powers, and indeed we go on expanding it. So here in Surah Dariyat, the Holy Quran introduces the concept of the expanding universe. So why is it important to understand this concept? It's important because the expanding universe points to our origins. It answers the question, how did we come to be? So to put it in simpler terms, there are three theories to explain how we, be we began, how the universe started. One, that the universe always existed, that it never had a beginning. Or two, the universe came into being by mere chance, out of nothing. Or three, that the universe was indeed created by a creator, or God. So the first question, did the universe have a beginning? This was answered by a brilliant American scientist by the name of Edwin Hubble in the 1920s. He studied the sizes and shapes of stars and he measured their distances from one another. And he discovered that the universe was much larger than we could ever imagine. And a few years later, he made another discovery that galaxies were actually moving. They were receding over time. And this so-called Hubble constant is based on this discovery that the universe is indeed expanding, just as the Holy Quran had described. So Hubble was able to determine the age of the universe, which is 13.8 billion years old. So the fact that we know the age of the universe means, in fact, that it did have a beginning. And to the second theory, that the universe came out of mere chance. Most scientists now subscribe to the so-called Big Bang Theory, as many of you know, in which a singular event led to the creation of the universe. But it was the Holy Quran, quite miraculously, that was the first text to describe this event. Allah Ta'ala says, Avalam yarallazina kafaru annasamavate wal arda kanata ratkan fafatakna huma. Do not the disbelievers see that the heaven and the earth were a closed up mass and then we opened them out. So Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad, Rahmaullah, describes in his book, Revelation, Rationality, Knowledge, and Truth, that the word ratkan used in this verse has two meanings in Arabic lexicon, total darkness and the coming together of things into a single entity. And the subsequent word, fatakna, means to open up, to cleave. And this is precisely the scientific description of a black hole, where a massive collapse of stars leads to darkness. And astronomers, the majority of astronomers, now believe that it was a black hole which was the precursor to the Big Bang, or Fatakna, where there was a massive and sudden release of energy. So Allah Almighty in Surah Anbiya laid out the description of events from 14 billion years ago, which only now science is presenting as a prevailing theory. Now this had a profound effect on one particular individual. There was a woman by the name of Danielle DeLuca. She was a student at Pratt Institute in New York. She was one of those people that was always skeptical of religion. And so she decided to start studying the major revealed texts of various religions just for the purposes of looking for flaws in them. And one day she went to her campus bookstore and she got a copy of the Holy Quran. And as she began reading the Holy Quran, she became subdued, unlike she was with any other text. And when she came across these verses from Surah Al-Anbiya, she was spellbound. She would later go on to say, and I quote, my mind was split asunder when I read this. It was the Big Bang. Suddenly, not just a theory, and I was astonished. It was the most exciting yet frightening time of my life. I read and studied and double-checked book after book until one night I sat in my library at Pratt Institute, staring wide-eyed at the pile of books in front of me and I couldn't believe what was happening. I realized I had in front of me the truth, the truth I had been so sure did not exist." Unquote. So remember those words in Surah Mulk, confused, dazzled, precisely the description of the impact of the words of the Allah Almighty on Danielle DeLuca, and she accepted Islam.
And to the final question, what was the inciting event that led to the Big, ba big Bang? Science still doesn't have an answer. But the Holy Quran does. As Allah Ta'ala says, anna ila rabbik al muntaha. The Lord is the final of all causes. So let us now come back to Clement and see where he's at in his life journey. So he's completed primary school and Clement now enrolls in law school in England. But he decides to leave early and he travels across Europe to discover science and faith. He goes to Egypt. He goes on an archeological dig up the Nile River. He goes to Syria. He goes to Palestine and Jerusalem. And he is introduced to various religions, one religion after another. He is then invited by some Mormon missionaries and he promises those missionaries that he will go to their holy city called Salt Lake City in Utah. So he takes the journey and it takes him one year by, by boat. And he lands in San Francisco and then he goes by carriage to Salt Lake City and he meets Mr. Brigham Young. But Clement's journey across the world still left him unfulfilled. So then he decided to go to Australia. There he took up a passion for meteorology. And in a very short period of time, he got worldwide, worldwide fame for scientific contributions. But yet, Clement was still yet to be enlightened. And again, remember Clement's story. We will come back to him again. So let us go to the second example of modern discovery. And from the telescope, I will take you to the microscope, to the field of embryogenesis, or the development of the human being in the womb. The microscope wasn't invented until the 16th century. So for thousands of years, we had no insight into what happens to the human during development. Until, that is, modern science finally caught up with what was already revealed in the Holy Quran 1,400 years ago. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Zumar, Halkam min ba'de halkin fi zulamatin salasa. He creates you in the womb of your mother's creation after creation in threefold darkness. And further in the Holy Quran, Allah Ta'ala gives even more description of embryogenesis in much more detail. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 14, Allah Ta'ala says, Summa khalaknan nutfata alakatan fa khalaknal alakata muzgatan fa khalaknal muzgata izaman fa kasonal izama lahma summa ansha'na ho khalkan akhara fa tabarakallahu asanul khalikin. Then we fashion the sperm into a clot. Then we fashion the clot into a shapeless lump. Then we fashion bones out of this shapeless lump. Then we clothe the bones with flesh. Then we developed it into another creation. So blessed be Allah, the best of creators. So the first verse describes zulumatin salasa, three veils of darkness in the womb of the mother. And scientists have now determined that there are three layers essential for fetal development. The abdominal wall, the uterine wall, and what's called the amniochorionic membrane, three veils of darkness. And the second verse specifically describes the appearance of the embryo during its development, using words such as mudga, meaning chewed flesh, or lam, meaning intact flesh, to distinguish the specific stages and the shape of the embryo during development. Dr. Keith Moore was a professor of embryology in Toronto. He studied embryogenesis, and he became a leading expert in its field. Now, he looked at these verses, and after pondering over them, he actually edited his own medical textbook to include these descriptions laid out in the Holy Quran. In fact, the medical school textbook that I used in medical school was written by Dr. Moore. And in 1981, during a conference of doctors, he said, and I quote, it is clear to me that these statements must have come to Muhammad from God or Allah, because almost all of this knowledge was not discovered until many centuries later. This proves to me that Muhammad must have been a messenger of God or Allah." Unquote. Another scholar, professor of anatomy, Dr. Tejata Tejasan, he was a Buddhist from Thailand. He too was profoundly impacted by these verses. He's an embryologist. And he went to a conference of medical embryology in Saudi Arabia. And this is what he said on stage in front of the audience, and I quote, from my study and what I have learned from this conference, I believe that everything that has been recorded in the Quran 1400 years ago must be true. That can be proved by scientific means. Since the Prophet Muhammad could neither read nor write, he must be a messenger who relayed this truth, which was revealed to him as an enlightenment by the one creator. This creator must be God. 
Therefore, I think it is time to say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, unquote. Dr. Chizasen, on stage, accepted Islam. So here we have two examples, two reputable professors from different parts of the world, one a Buddhist, one a Christian, objectively studying the descriptions presented in the Holy Quran from 1400 years ago on the development of the human, and both declaring it under un no uncertain terms to be divine in origin. And for the last example of discovery, we go to the depths of the ocean. In the late 19th century, there lived a Frenchman named Dr. Philip Grenier. He was an oceanic explorer, a deep sea diver. And it so happened one day, he was given a copy of the Holy Quran in French. He opened the Quran and he opened it to Surah Al-Nur, verse 41. In this verse, the Quran employs the metaphor of the deep sea to explain the darkness which can engulf a disbeliever. Allah Ta'ala says in that verse, their deeds are like thick darkness in a vast and deep sea, which a wave covers, over which there is another wave, above which are clouds, layers of darkness one upon another. When he holds out his hand, he can hardly see it. And he whom Allah gives no light, for him there is no light at all. This is Surah Nur, verse 41. So it wasn't until 1878 that the self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, or scuba, was invented. And it was only until then that scientists could analyze the ocean floor. And they now know that light, it starts to diminish when it gets deeper in the ocean. And it loses its spectrum at 50 meters. And at a depth of 300 meters, the darkness is so intense that it's described that a diver will not be able to see his own hand precisely the description that is used in the Holy Quran. Dr. Grenier was deeply impacted, being a diver himself, and he said, and I quote, I was startled. I was startled how Muhammad has incredibly explained the state of darkness of these misguided people. This expression could only be expected of a seasoned expert of oceanic waves to describe such a scene. Later, when I learned that Muhammad never even saw an ocean, and he never traveled in deep waters, this thought enlightened my heart that this could only be the words of God Almighty, who hears and responds to the desperate calls of human souls. I continued my reflection, and I joined Islam. So, my dear brothers, here we have three discoveries from outer space to the development of the human in the womb to the descriptions of the depths of the ocean first described in the Holy Quran and through their discovery, scientists have embraced Islam and joined the fold of Islam. And there are many, many more scientific discoveries waiting to be made. Questions that linger, such as whether there is life on other planets or if there is a single unifying atomic force or what are the precise medicinal properties of honey? The Quran gives us these answers, but their proof in the form of discovery will come in due time, when Allah wills, inshallah. Maybe in our lifetime, maybe from someone among Jamaat Ahmadiyya, maybe from someone in this very room. Because we are living in the moment of discovery right now, one only need to read the opening verses of Surah al takvir the verses recited so beautifully in the beginning of the session by Tariq Malik Saab. Just listen to those verses and you can appreciate that indeed the time of the Akhirin is upon us. When our beloved Imam leads the international bath on a summer afternoon in London, while we are repeating simultaneously that sacred oath in Los Angeles at 5 a.m. via satellite orbiting the earth, we can't help but reflect on the verse, and when people are brought together. When flying above the Arabian desert are planes which have cut travel time from months to days to mere hours, we cannot help but reflect on the verse, and when the she-camels, 10 months pregnant, are abandoned. When ink pens are replaced by printing presses, when printing presses are replaced by virtual clouds of data where libraries can be browsed with the swipe of a finger, we cannot help but reflect and when books are spread abroad. When we drive on highways cut through granite or travel through cities with skyscrapers where rocky ranges once stood, we cannot help 
but reflect Vaisal Jibalo Soyera, and when the mountains are made to move. When the rover sends us pictures of the red dunes of Mars, or Juno reveals the beauty of Jupiter's stripes, we cannot help but reflect Vaisas Sama O Koshetat, and when the heaven is laid bare. All around us are discoveries being made, and all around us are prophecies being fulfilled. All of these prophecies pointing to the latter days and vouching for perhaps the greatest modern discovery of them all mentioned in the Holy Quran, and that is the advent of the promised Messiah, alayhi salam. So let us get back to our story of Clement. It is now May of 1908. Clement is a world famous scientist. He has an institute bearing his name. He is now 56 years old and having traveled from Europe to the Middle East, to America, to Australia, he accepts an invitation to give a lecture on astronomy in Lahore, India. And there in attendance at the lecture is a man by the name of Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. It was apparent to Mufti Saab that Clement was an inquisitive man in search of truth. So Mufti Saab approached Mr. Clement and he said, you are a traveler, you have been to a lot of places, but have you ever seen a prophet of God? And have you ever heard of his claim? To which Clement replied, I have traveled to most of the world, but I have never seen a prophet of God, and it is such a person I am looking for. So on May 12th, 1908, Mr. Clement was taken to the village of Qadian and he found himself in the blessed audience of the promised Messiah alayhi salam. And over two days, two sessions with Mufti Saab as a translator, Clement asked Masim alayhi salam many questions on topics, God versus Satan, sin versus virtue, good versus evil, and yes, science versus faith. All of Clement's questions were answered to his satisfaction, and he finally said to the promised Messiah alayhi salam, and I quote, I used to think that between science and religion, there was some mutual contradiction and opposition. And this is the view generally held by learned men in both camps, but your conception of religion quite reconciles the two." Unquote. To which the Promised Messiah al -Islam responded, that is the very reason for which I have been sent. I have come to prove to the world that no teaching of Islam contradicts any proved and established truth of the sciences." Unquote. This was only a few weeks before Blessed Masim al-Islam passed away from this world. So Clement, a world-renowned scientist, a global traveler, a truth seeker who went across five continents during his life searching for answers, he finally found that congruity of science and faith in the tiny hamlet of Qadian, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him to the discovery he had sought for so long, the Messiah of the age, who was promised to humanity in the Holy Quran in the purpose of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, and in a letter he would write to Mufti Muhammad Sadiq anhu, Clement declared that he accepted Ahmadiyyat. So this is the story of Clement Lindley Reg. He eventually settled in New Zealand where he lived for the remainder of his life. His progeny had the honor of meeting our beloved Hazur in 2006 during his historic visit to New Zealand. Hazur even prayed at the gravesite of Mr. Clement Reg, who history will forever record inshallah as the first Ahmadi Muslim of New Zealand. Clement's remarkable story is a reminder. It's a reminder to all of us of the harmony between science and Islam, between prediction and persuasion, between modern discovery and the Holy Quran. And above all, Clement's story is testimony to the purpose, to the advent of the Promised Messiah al-Islam, who rightfully said, Is waqt khuda ta'ala ne mazhabi umur ko khisse aur kata ke rang mein nahi rakha hai, balke mazhab ko ek science aur ilm bina diya hai. Or yehi waja hai ke ye zamana kashre hakayak ka zamana hai, jab ke har baat ko ilmi rang me zahir kiya jata hai, mai is liye beja gaya hu ke har etekad ko or Qur'an-e Kareem ke kasas ko ilmi rang me zahir karo. God does not describe religious facts in mere stories. He has now brought religion to conform to the sciences 
and it is for that very reason that the present age is the age of bringing facts to light and things are given an academic tint. I have been sent for this purpose that I may expound Islamic teachings and the Quranic stories according to the modern way of thinking. Malfuzat, Volume 2. May the words of the Holy Quran continue to dazzle the world with their brilliance and their beauty. May Allah enable the message of Hazrat Akhtas Masih Ma'ud alayhi salatu wasalam, who was the light, the nur of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, reach the eyes and the minds and the hearts of scientists and truth seekers now and in the future, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana. Anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.